Okay, guys. I got it working. I believe it's working now. It should be working. Hopefully you guys are back. Yay! <laughs> Lots of prayer and it's working. Thank you God. Um, I uh, did one of the most simple things and unmuted my microphone on my computer. Somehow my microphone got muted on my actual computer and it wasn't showing up anywhere else but I just hit the keyboard shortcut on my keyboard for to unmute my microphone and now it's working <laughs> wow okay so sorry about that guys okay so let's actually get started with this uh, welcome again. Sorry we're getting started so late, um, but uh, thank you for sticking with me uh, once again. Uh, and I am, I didn't have time to pre-record today, so I am doing live, as you probably figured out. And so here we are, and I uh, want to thank you again for coming. And just uh, another introduction, wanted to let you know who I am, in case you didn't watch the first videos. If you have not watched the first videos uh, on my channel, you can look at the first two. This is the third in a series of two. We focused on mostly nutrition in the last two lectures, and now we're going to talk about exercise. And um, just so you know, remember, exercise, <clears throat> same as what I said before, you want to consult your doctor. Uh, before you get started with an exercise program. And um, for the most part, you will, you can experience benefits. Pretty much anybody can can exercise. Uh, you might have some limitations, but there's a variety of different types of exercise you can do for your health, and it will benefit your health. If you can move in any way, um, it can be a benefit to your health. Um, but of course, make sure you consult your uh, doctor before you start making changes. So um, what I'd like to do is also just, um, again, let you know that um, I am a um, fourth year medical student right now in West Virginia, and I have a master's degree in exercise science. And if, a couple weeks ago, I got accepted into residency in Texas, Harlingen, Texas. So I'll be going there for a residency in July. Um, and um, yeah, uh, one thing I did want to uh, bring up also, with these lectures, um, I know I talk about obesity, um, but I'm not primarily addressing those who are overweight, although that is, um, you know, a health condition that um, would need to be addressed, but that's not the only issue. You can be a healthy weight and still be incredibly unhealthy, and you can still have, you know, heart attacks and diabetes and other things. I had seen a patient during some of my clinical rotations who did have diabetes, yet he looked very fit. He had a, a thin waistline. He had, um, you know, um, abs and... Um, you know, he, you could tell that he worked out, but yet he had very serious uh, diabetes. And so, uh, and he was young too, in his, I think his mid to late 30s, and uh, he had diabetes <clears throat> because his diet was not very good at all. And so, um, it's, I'm not just talking about obese individuals or overweight individuals, I'm talking about all of us, all of us can do this and also it's a matter of prevention. So if you're young, it does still matter. Okay, I think that's all the preliminaries. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So we're gonna talk about 
the health benefits of physical activity. And, um, you know, I spend a lot of time kind of talking about that with nutrition. And I feel like I need to do a lot more of a thorough job justifying the nutrition principles of a plant, a whole food plant-based diet, unfortunately, because people hold food as very important to them. And so when you try to tell someone to change their, their dietary habits, it can lead to a lot of strife sometimes. Uh, people don't really like what you're telling them. Um, but I'm telling you what's based on uh, what's been found in the evidence. Um, but for exercise, I feel like it's a lot easier. I think pretty much everybody agrees that exercise is important for your health. Um, but of course, we saw that chart, and I'll show it again, of the health risks uh, related to dietary factors being greater than tobacco and physical activity was lower on the list compared to other things. We'll see that again in this lecture. Um, we're also going to talk about the health risks of physical inactivity because there are risks associated with not being active. We're going to show you how to get active and then how to stay on the right track and some things you probably didn't know about exercise. So first of all, I want to start out with a question. And that is, are you exercising? Are you exercising? If you said yes, then that's great. Thank, that's great. You know, keep up the good work. Um, and you might learn some things you can improve in this lecture. Um, but ask yourself the question, what are you doing and how often? And what are some of the benefits that you yourself have experienced? If the answer is no, then the question is, why not? Good job, Brittany. Keep up the good work. Um, and you know, besides why, why aren't you exercising? The other question you want to ask yourself is, do you want to start? Because if you're not exercising, um, you shouldn't despair because like we're going to talk about something is better than nothing. Um, so who says exercise is good for your health? Um, actually, many, many years ago, someone said, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. That was Hippocrates. And um, another interesting quote, this was an individual who wrote during the late 1800s, and she said, more people die for want of exercise than from overwork. For many more rust out than wear out. In idleness, the blood does not circulate freely and the changes in the vital fluids so necessary to health and life do not take place. And it's so, I think, profound that she wrote this because she was writing at a time when doctors were recommending smoking for health benefits. So she was way ahead of her time and we'll see that the statement about many more rust out than wear out is actually um, found to be true from the research. She also said the more we exercise, the better. We'll see that there's a dose response relationship with exercise. Um, so she says, the more we exercise, the better will be the circulation of blood. Those who accustom themselves to proper exercise in the open air will generally have a good and vigorous circulation. So anyway, that's um, things that have been written in the past. So these benefits have been known for a long time, but now uh, we see that the evidence is showing it. I'll be referencing a document from the Department of Health and Human Services. They put together a document and it's in my references. Um, the first one, showing the um, evidence related to exercise, um, the recommendations, and they've compiled all the evidence from the research in regards to exercise. And I thought it was, they have some interesting facts and statistics and recommendations, so I'm going to share some of those with you. Um, first thing is that exercise really is great medicine, uh, and that's what the evidence shows. It can improve your quality of life. 
physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, also, it'll help you sleep better by what it does is reducing the time it takes for you to get to sleep and increasing the time in deep sleep. Um, and now uh, it'll also reduce daytime sleepiness. Now, the benefits related to sleep, uh, you know, of course, also getting sunlight and fresh air also can help specifically the sunlight because uh, you have something in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And when that uh, receives input of light from your eyes, that helps to determine the amount of melatonin that's released. And it's thought that if you are getting enough sunlight during the day, then your body will produce the right amount of melatonin at night and help you to sleep better. So that's why it's important to get out in the sun in the day. Uh, you want to, or also another benefit of exercise is that it will improve your cognitive function, specifically memory, attention, executive function. Um, that's why it's important that you exercise now so that you can, um, because exercise probably has the most profound, um, the most um, uh, powerful thing you can do to prevent Alzheimer's. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that uh, it will help because it prevents that decline in cognitive function. So um, also there's better performance academically in the youth um, and there's reduced risk of falling or injury from falling when you do fall. And one small dose can help. Just one session of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise can reduce your blood pressure, improve your insulin sensitivity, improve your sleep, reduce anxiety, improve some aspects of cognition on the day that, they, that it was performed. Also, uh, within days or weeks of consistent physical activity, you'll have uh, disease risk reduction, improve physical function. So the, there's a lot of benefits even with just starting a little bit you know, with a little bit of exercise. So don't just think that you have to be training for a marathon. Um, you can be, uh, you know, just do what you can and something is better than nothing. So how about if you have arthritis? Um, well, actually the uh, recommendations are that for arthritis, it's beneficial to get up to 10,000 steps in per day and it won't be harmful for you if you have osteoarthritis um, and also um, 150 minutes per week of aerobic exercise plus doing some muscle strengthening exercises can be helpful in arthritis. Also resistance exercise improves muscle strength in those with uh, other conditions like uh, those who have had a stroke, those who have had multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, or spinal cord injuries. Um, and the thing that's interesting is, uh, it doesn't, it's, uh, you can overdose, <laughs> you can exercise too much, uh, uh, but you have to exercise quite a bit to exercise too much. Um, and our bodies are very resilient and we'll talk about the principles of progression, but as you continue to train, your body will adjust and you'll be able to do more and more exercise with less and less of a strain on your system, less and less overload on your system. Um, and, but for the most part, there's a dose response relationship. So the more, the better. Um, and in this, what that means, dose res when I say dose response relationship, is that the more you do, the greater the response. The more of this pill, if you will, that you take of exercise, the greater the response will be. And Specifically, the areas that research has shown that response to be so is um, there's a dose response relationship between exercise and all cause mortality reduction, um, total cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, the more exercise you do, the lower your risk of developing these um, conditions. And here is just a graph or a um, figure demonstrating this uh, increased amount of uh, physical activity with a decrease in mortality or hazard ratio as it's shown here. So the more you do, the lower your risk of mortality. 
uh, especially just here getting you know there's set the slope drops very steep here in the in the beginning so getting that's right around the recommendation 150 minutes of exercise per week um, and we'll talk about what those the actual recommendations are for exercise so how are we doing in um, America in the US it looks like only about 20% uh, of males maybe or I'd say 25 I didn't get the actual number but if it, just eyeballing it from the graph there about 25% of men are meeting the recommendations of aerobic and strength training guidelines um, and uh, women it looks like are a little bit less um, 15 to 20 percent it looks like so what are we doing why aren't we reaching these guidelines for physical activity not enough time right that's what everyone says um, but it's important that we assess our current priorities because when we looked at the the benefits the benefits are so great uh, with physical activity and we're going to talk about the health risk in a second um, but uh, assess your priorities because this is something that's very important for your health um, for the rest of your life and then we need to determine what's most important when we assess our priorities and then make the necessary changes somebody once said to me I'm paraphrasing what they said uh, but um, you're never going to have enough time, you're never going to have enough money, and you're always going to be too busy. So you might as well start today. Um, and that's so true. We are always going to have other commitments and things. But once we make something a habit, uh, it becomes a lot easier. And it's just uh, something we do, a part of our lives. So what are we doing? It looks like we are watching a lot of TV um, and uh, for the first time, according to this eMarketer data, uh, looks like we are surpassing TV watching time by time spent on mobile devices, of course. Now, the TV watching time here doesn't include watching digital TV, from what I understand. Um, but... Uh, um, it looks like, uh, still, regardless, we're spending a lot of time watching TV. You know, think about if you would just spend a half hour of that time exercising. Um, and of course, I think probably some people are not always just sitting there watching TV. Maybe they're doing other things while they're watching TV, but um, in all fairness. But, you know, uh, it is important uh, for us to prioritize and just consider. You know, how much TV am I watching? It'd be interesting to see how much advertisements we watch in our lifetime. Uh, because, uh, you know, imagine if you could spend, that's so much wasted time, seeing these advertisements for things that, uh, you know, all of a sudden we think that we need. Uh, but um, that's not what I'm talking about today. But... Uh, you know, the point is that uh, we just need to, to look at how much time and assess how much time. Maybe you aren't watching a lot of TV, but maybe you're spending a lot of time on your phone uh, doing things on Facebook or things like that. So it's just good to assess um, what we're doing. And uh, here it is, the health risks of physical inactivity. This was a study published in The Lancet looking at um, basically public health data uh, looking at the, basically, if you removed physical inactivity uh, from the population, what would be the effect on the burden of disease from different conditions? So, for instance, if you, what, um, physical inactivity was attributed to 6% of the burden of disease caused by coronary heart disease, 7% burden of disease caused by diabetes, 9% of the burden of disease caused by premature mortality, 10% of breast cancer, 10% of colon cancer. So uh, these are, are um, you know, wow, that's a, that's a, 
a lot of things, you know, imagine if we eliminated physical inactivity. What they define physical inactivity is not reaching the minimal amount of that physical activity recommendations, which is 150 minutes per week of physical activity. What are some other negatives of physical inactivity? Um, well, when you look at it, it's uh, costly to our healthcare system. It costs $117 billion annually in healthcare dollars. Well, that's really neat, pun intended. Um, NEAT is actually a um, acronym that stands for Non-Exercise Activity Thermogenesis. And uh, what it means is that uh, Basically, people burn a different amount of calories when they're maybe someone who's a fidgeter. You know, they move around a lot while they're sitting um, and things like that. And also, just standing up, you burn more calories than you would sitting. It's estimated that uh, if um, obese individuals spent about two and a half less hours sedentary, they would burn an additional 269 to 477 calories per day. That's a lot. <laughs> so, um, you probably heard physical inactivities related to um, the risks of smoking. Um, yes, it's that bad. Uh, it can actually increase um, life expectancy of the world by 0.68 years if everyone who's currently inactive became active. Um, and other estimates show about in the, U in the United States, uh, that it was about 1.3 to 3.7 years increase in life expectancy, or other studies have shown one to two, over two years, um, increase in life expectancy if those who are currently inactive became active, that is. Um, and, um, the uh, increase in life expectancy from smoking was 1.1 to 2.5 years in the USA and other countries. It, it was actually uh, in other higher income uh, countries. Uh, so you can see the increase in life expectancy when elim eliminating that risk factor is similar for smoking compared to uh, physical inactivity uh, if you eliminated those risk factors. And then if you look at obesity, uh, it's also similar. If you, if those who are currently obese were not obese anymore, they would add one uh, about a half a year to 1.1 years to life expectancy in the United States. And here again is the chart I showed um, demonstrating that dietary risk factors um, were one of the greatest risk factors for um, different conditions and uh, even greater than tobacco use. Now, that was over 500,000 deaths in one year. I think it was 2018. And uh, low physical activity is also on this, this chart here. And it's about 100,000. And uh, uh, disability adjusted life years, low physical activity is also on here. Um, and it's a lot less than dietary factors, but it's still on there. Okay, okay, so you probably are getting an idea about what I'm saying. You need to exercise. Um, but how do you get started? So that's what we're going to talk about now. And I mentioned this already, but beware of all or nothing thinking. What does that mean? Well, um, I find that sometimes people have the idea that if they are not training for a marathon, they might as well not exercise. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but, you know, if I'm not training for some kind of race, I might as well just not exercise. And that's actually um, not a good idea to have, because as we see, even just a little bit of exercise um, can show health benefits. So even if you just have 10 minutes, get out and exercise, um, because um, you'll show benefits. And, and the benefits... Um, come even still, you know, the recommendations are 30 minutes per day, but if you can do that in three bouts of 10 minutes separate at separate time periods during the day, you can get the same benefits. 
Also, if you don't even have 10 minutes, do five minutes. That's fine too. Um, but evidence suggests that participating in no more than one hour per week of moderate intensity physical exercise is, ex is associated with lower risk of all-cause mortality and the incidence of coronary heart disease. So you'll still be experiencing health benefits even if you just get an hour per week of exercise. So that's less than 10 minutes per day, actually. Um, just a little bit less. So just do something, you know, go for a walk for 10 minutes. Um, just start there. Um, because the first step is, is, is allotting that, t that period of time to exercise. Then you can, once it becomes a habit that you have that period of time dedicated to exercise, then you can maybe change the intensity and adjust other things. I'm hoping you can see, I just realized my face might be in the way. So, um, okay. So I came up with a little pyramid of the um, most important components of physical activity, of exercise um, for your health, in regards to your health. And it's an upside down pyramid because uh, balance training is on the bottom. For, for elderly individuals, balance can be, balance training can be especially helpful. We'll talk about more why. But the most important thing that you should do for your health and the most important priority that you should have initially when you're starting an exercise program, if you're not exercising at all, is cardiorespiratory endurance exercise. Now, what does that mean? That means exercise where you're, usually, you're utilizing the major muscle groups and uh, it's rhythmic and it's um, uh, an extended duration. And so what that does is um, you'll be burning more fat that way when you when you are doing this this cardio respiratory exercise and you'll be burning the most calories since you're using the major muscle groups. This would include walking, uh, swimming, uh, elliptical machines, uh, rowing, things like this. Walking and swimming or, or running probably being some of the activities where you would burn probably the most calories. Um, and uh, I have a list of those um, on, uh, in a few slides of, in regards to what activity, um, what, how activities rate on calorie burning wise. Anyway, um, the next thing would be muscular strength. And these two are, are really the most important components of a physical activity program. Uh, and when I say muscular strength, I'm including muscular endurance as well. So resistance training in essence. Um, there's a lot of benefits also of resistance training and we can't um, uh, uh, stress that enough. Also, uh, flexibility um, and uh, a couple times per week if you have time and then lastly the balance exercises which would be more for elderly but you can do that now as well if you'd like. You can practice uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can practice balance exercises, standing on one leg, walking backwards, different things that you can do. Of course, if you are elderly, be careful, um, you know, use a chair to help you. Um, but uh, those are some things that you can try. So what are the recommendations? Well, the recommendations are, the minimal recommendations are 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise most days, preferably every day. And this is for adults, by the way. The recommendations are different for um, children and also for older adults. But um, for the most part, for most of us, the recommendations are 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise per day, aerobic wise. And then resistance training would be two days per week, uh, working um, all major muscle groups. And so uh, you would want to do probably at least eight exercises per session, and you want to do um, about three sets of 10 repetitions for each exercise. And what that means is a set would be, uh, if you're lifting weights, uh, like one, two, three, four, up to 10, that would be repetitions. 
and then a set would be you take a break and then you do 10 more and that would be your second set so you want to do three sets of, of 10 um, for just general um, muscle health and again I'm giving you the basics there's a lot more details you could go into and if you have more questions in detail you can always ask me so of course more is better there's greater benefits shown if you get more than 300 minutes per week of exercise which is 500 or I mean five hours per week uh, so more is better and I like to keep things simple and so I've come up with sort of a simple way to explain to people what to do for exercise and that is stand up first step stand up more you know um, get a standing desk work standing if you work at a computer most of the time I have that kind of setup when I work putting together this PowerPoint I was standing a lot of the time um, sometimes not but um, you know standing up is the first step and that can even benefit your health and you'll burn more calories uh, move around so that would be the cardio part the aerobic exercise pick things up that would be the resistance training put them down that would be flexibility and then refuel so you want to you know nutrition is obviously still an important component for weight loss and then you want to start over and do it all over again stand up move around pick things up put them down and refuel so um, that's Josh's exercise recommendations uh, so there's also another few components of exercise that are important to talk about because you could say yeah I'm exercising but how hard are you working and how often are you doing it how much time are you spend spending doing it and what type of exercise is it so um, I want to focus mostly on the intensity which would be how hard you're working now if you have a heart rate monitor it's a lot easier to assess how hard you're working because the recommendations are moderate to vigorous intensity and so you need to know what that means and if you don't have a heart rate monitor um, well first of all if you do have a heart rate monitor you can use your percentage of your maximum heart rate and you can figure out your maximum heart rate and just estimate a ballpark by taking 220 subtracting your age from 220 uh, then you come up with your max heart rate and then you want to be exercising at a percentage of that so about 75 percent of your max heart rate would be a moderate um, intensity and above that would be vigorous um, and so another way though to tell is if you just use your breathing as a gauge if you are just uh, exercising and you want to know what intensity you're at you're trying to get it moderate to vigorous if you can sing without being out of breath um, you're probably you're definitely at a light intensity if you are walking and you have to take a breath to finish a complete sentence maybe you're exercising with someone else and you have to take a breath that's a moderate intensity if you're vigorous you're you will you'll be having a lot more trouble um, talking um, at all so that's a good gauge they've shown so some other principles that are important is the volume and progression so volume is kind of a measure a different way to measure activity based on your caloric expenditure you might have heard of the term METS which is metabolic equivalence and basically it's just a way of assessing how many calories you're burning in a particular exercise um, and kind of generalizing it to to everyone so that everyone can use you know kind of estimate based on what activity they're performing uh, and so you can figure out how many calories you're burning per minute based on METs um, now different activities there's a chart that'll show you have different levels of METs like running uh, gardening swimming different things have different level of METs and then depending on how long you perform that activity you can determine your MET minutes and if you determine your MET minutes um, you can figure out basically how many calories you're burning and the recommendations if you look at it from MET minutes is 500 greater than 500 to 1000 MET minutes per week um, and uh, basically one MET would be your resting energy expenditure that's the idea so anything above that is um, 
like let's say an activity was four METs, that would be four, that would be basically four times the level of you resting quietly um, in intensity. So, uh, and then progression, I already mentioned sort of, but uh, it just is the principle that as you go, you, your body will adjust. You want to consistently, another principle is called overload, where you're overloading your body, um, you're stressing your body um, to an extent so that it has to adjust. And once it adjusts, it will become, um, it will become um, more adapt to that. And then you can progress and increase the duration and intensity of that workload. So for instance, someone like an athlete, they have been exercising, you know, basically all their life and fine tuning their body and skills all their life. If they went out for a half hour walk, that would not be anything for them. Uh, they're so much more efficient um, from all those years of training. But someone that's never has not exercised maybe in years and they go out and do a 30 minute walk and maybe they have other health conditions or they're overweight, that 30 minute walk could be um, very difficult. And so they need to, you need to work up to that. Uh, one recommendation is to increase the duration of exercise. Maybe you're starting at 10 minutes per day. Start increasing your exercise duration five to 10 minutes every one to two weeks. Uh, that's per week, five to 10 minutes per week for the first one to two weeks. Um, for the first four to six and that will help you to maintain adherence to whatever exercise program you're starting and reduce adverse events like injuries uh, and so that's that's important because a lot of people drop out of exercise programs when they start within six months 50 percent um, the last I checked uh, drop out of an exercise program and so you want to do things that make it a habit and make it part of your lifestyle that's what's important um, and so do things you enjoy and make it interesting. Try new things um, as far as activity goes. So here's a chart with METs um, and they're adjusted based on different weight uh, weights on here. But basically um, you see jumping ropes is, rope is 12.3 METs. And think about it though, that's jumping rope constantly so uh you know uh it's it's difficult to jump rope for a half hour um i mean i'm sure some people do that maybe longer but uh you know uh you um it's pretty intense and that would be constantly jump roping uh running at six miles per hour that would be it the numbers on the treadmill correspond to miles per hour so if you're running at a six on the treadmill at six miles per hour, that would be 9.8 mets, and so on on this chart you can see, just to give you an idea of different activities. So move more, get off of the couch, get up off the couch um, by standing up more, using the stairs, maybe parking further away from the door at work. And then step two, make it a priority. So set aside the time, make it part of your routine, Aim for that 30 minutes and remember, something is always better than nothing. I've said it multiple times. And I mentioned motivation a little bit um, and dropout rates. Um, but uh, here are some ways that you can stay motivated. You uh, look at um, different ways to stay motivated. One, you can leave your clothes uh, out the day before so you see them when you wake up and Oh, I have to go exercise. Maybe it's going to the gym or going outside and walking or whatever it might be. Just get set up the day before. Get the whole family involved. Social support is so important. And so, you know, try to keep that going and then keep each other accountable. Change it up, like I mentioned. Try something new. And uh, just a little bit about flexibility. Uh, it uh, can be helpful. Uh, to increase range of motion and that would be if you're going to do a stretch you would hold it there for um, 30 to 60 seconds at least um, make, and, and and you know when you do it um, you do it for different muscles and you want to do it when your muscles are warm so you'd want to actually warm up first ideally um, and then do the stretching exercises 
but uh, it can help reduce aches and pains, improve your balance. And uh, when you do do it, just make sure you breathe in through your stomach, take deep breaths. Um, and just a little bit about the balance exercises. Um, can improve proprioception, which is just a perception of where your different body parts are. And that's really important in the elderly. It's been shown to actually reduce uh, hip fractures because it reduces the risk of falls. And so um, having the elderly do these balance exercises can be helpful. And um, I don't have any specifically listed here, but um, if you have any questions about that, we can talk more. Remember to warm up, remember to cool down drink plenty of water, and I already talked about overload. So let's transition and talk a little bit about some things you might not know about related to exercise. Uh, maybe some misconceptions or just some fun facts. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, we see the how much higher the dietary risk factors are as a risk for, for health in this country um, than are, you know, it's contributed to over 500,000 deaths. Um, and, uh, and that is very significant. So, you know, you can't ignore uh, nutrition. So you can exercise all you want, but if you don't, if you're not eating healthy, you can still have underlying health conditions that may be masked by maybe a good external appearance. Uh, but physiologically, maybe you, you still are not functioning very well. So you want to keep that in mind. And also you need to keep in mind that it takes a tremendous amount of calories to burn off certain things, uh, certain uh, foods. And I'm going to pull something up really quick because... Uh, Dr. Drozik, who I mentioned last time, he's a lifestyle medicine practitioner. He has some slides just showing the amount of calories, the amount of exercise you'd have to do to burn off certain foods. So uh, here's one here. A Snickers bar, a two ounce, 266 calorie Snickers bar, you need to walk for an hour and 24 minutes to burn off those that many calories. A Krispy Kreme original great glazed donut is 109 cal 90 calories. You need to walk an hour to burn that off. And then Coca-Cola, 12 ounces, is 140 calories. You need to walk 45 minutes to burn that off. And the average American is consuming about 500 excess calories per day. That's two and a half hours of exercise a day. So you can see you have to do more than just exercise. Um, I mean, this is just speaking about weight loss. But, I mean, as far as weight loss and health benefits go, you need both of them and uh, it can be a powerful um, benefit for you. So what if you, you know, what if you can't afford or don't have a gym membership? Does that mean you can't exercise? Absolutely not. Um, actually, when I was in Pennsylvania and I worked in a hospital up there, uh, I worked with uh, a student and we developed some chair exercises that patients in the nutrition clinic could watch while they're in the waiting room. And chair exercises are really, um, actually really good. You can find a lot of weird videos on YouTube of chair exercises, <laughs> um, but uh, even though they're weird, they're very helpful. Uh, and I've done them before, and, and I actually, you know, you work up a sweat doing them. And it's especially good if you have trouble with weight bearing and you don't have access to a pool, which would be more like lower impact so it wouldn't affect your, your knees as much. Every pound loss is about five pounds off stress off of your knees. Um, so, um, you know, uh, that is why doing the more weight bearing exercises can be so much stressful, cause, uh, can be so much more stressful on your joints if you are overweight or obese. But these chair exercises are great for many different types of people with different health conditions. Um, and I have a video on the next slide. I'm not going to show it because I don't know if YouTube's going to take it down, but it's the video of me um, and um, my uh, colleagues doing the chair exercises. And I'll show you, I'll, I can post a link to that as well. 
So the other thing you can do is you can just exercise in your house, up, go up and down your stairs, use your body weight. There's a guy, I wish I meant, uh, brought it up, I forget his name, but um, he does entirely body weight exercises, a lot of pull-ups and things like that. I can't remember his name, but um, he it's, it's actually, he's on a whole nother level, basically. Uh, he's doing crazy things on a pull-up bar, and that's basically all he uses, and he is ripped, you know? So uh, you can do a lot with just your body weight. And be creative, and go for walks. Even if it's cold, you can bundle up and go for walks. Um, and while we're experiencing the coronavirus and you're on, you know, stay-at-home orders, you can do a lot in your house, though. For instance, here's some examples. Um, you can set up your own circuit, do some squats, do some lunges, wall sits, do a minute of each of these and set up a circuit in your in your house and you can do squats, lunges, wall sits, calf raises and then for your upper body you could do planks, sit-ups, push-ups, dips. If you don't know what those are, um, I could explain more if you just uh, ask in the chat, I'll, I'll try to explain better. Now there's the video but I'm not going to show it because they might take my video down. I think I downloaded this one, but I'm just worried they might stop the video again. So, uh, here's another myth. A lot of people say, uh, well, I need to burn off my uh, belly fat, so I'm going to do a lot of sit-ups. Well, it turns out that that's not actually true. And the reason is primarily, like we talked about before, when you're, the cardiovascular exercise is what you want to focus on. You're going to burn more belly fat by doing cardiovascular exercise because you're going to be burning more calories uh, in general. Um, evidence has shown that if you do aerobic exercise plus the abdominal exercise, it could help. It could reduce your waist circumference and other things possibly. Um, so do them in combination. But again, remember that pyramid. You want to try to get the cardiovascular exercise. Then once you meet the recommendations of 30 minutes per day of cardiovascular exercise and you have enough time, start adding the resistance training and so on. Um, but you want to make sure that you're focusing on the most important beneficial factors for your health first. So what's the best time to exercise? Some people say, and there's maybe some evidence to show that first thing in the morning is the best time. When your testosterone is highest, your cortisol levels are highest, and you can, uh, you know, uh, aid in weight loss and burning fat in the morning time better. Um, possibly, uh, maybe after meals too, there's um, evidence to suggest that it can decrease the spike in blood sugar. Helps you to, uh, especially if you're diabetic, doing this would be helpful because it helps to bring that glucose into your cells to lower that um, blood glucose level to do it immediately after you eat, go for a walk. Um, not vigorous exercise, obviously, um, after you eat, but doing something light after you eat could be really beneficial. And uh, of course, but you know, in regards to timing, the first thing is do it when you have time. You know, um, whenever you have time to do it, do it. Don't worry if you can't do it in the morning. Uh, don't worry about it. Just do it another time when you when you have the time. That is what you want to, you know, the important thing is that you're doing it. What about protein? So you know that I have been recommending, and if you haven't watched the previous lectures, I speak a lot more about the evidence behind plant-based diets. But uh, if you, if you, um, uh, one of the questions that people often ask is what about protein? Where do I get my protein if I'm going to go plant-based? And how do we do that? So let's look at, first of all, the recommendations for protein. The uh, RDA for protein is 0.8 grams per kilogram. And uh, a simple way that you could figure that out, because uh, we use pounds here in the U.S. still, and so uh, you can multiply your weight in pounds by 0.36. <clears throat> and that's how much protein, how many grams protein you need per day. Um, that's according to the RDA. Of course, that, there's differences between individuals. And if you're an athlete, you potentially need more, maybe 1 to 1.2 grams or potentially even more um, of protein per day. But let's look, how much protein are Americans getting? Uh, 
males are getting 96.6 grams of protein per day, and females are getting 69.4, uh, 20 and over females, 20 and over males. That's how much protein they're getting. And um, this, in comparison with the recommendations, um, if you look at the average height and weight, if you look at the average weight of Americans, uh, uh, males, you see that the requirement would be 71.2 grams of protein per day. And that's versus what they were actually getting, which is 96.6 grams protein per day. So obviously um, men in America are getting way more protein than uh, is recommended. Uh, well, way higher than the RDA is what I should say. And females are getting, um, you know, compared to what would be recommended based on the average weight of women in the United States, they would need 61.4 grams per day. And that's compared to 69.4. So they're getting a little bit higher still amounts of protein per day. Now let's look at the comparison. This is a data from the Adventist Health Study again. And it's showing the comparison in protein intake between the non-vegetarians in that study. In other words, the um, individuals that eat meat Um, and uh, those who are strict vegetarian, in other words, completely plant-based. And it's very similar. They're still getting about the same amount of protein per day. And the difference between lacto-ovo, pesco, it's all very similar. And um, they're getting above the recommended amounts, as you can see, um, based on the average weight of Americans. Just for men, it's 71.2 grams, 61.4 grams for females. This is a combination of male and females, but still, they're even getting above the recommended amounts. So let's do some comparisons. What do you think protein comparison would be between one cup of cooked lentils and a three-ounce steak? Well, there's 18 grams of proteins in a cup of cooked lentils and 21 grams in three ounces of steak. So look, they're very, very similar. How about peanut butter compared to three large eggs? So we're looking at a, this would be a peanut butter sandwich with two slices of whole grain bread. Now you'd be surprised, whole grain or multi-grain breads actually have um, quite a bit of protein in them, relatively speaking. And so, you know, that's in comparison with the white breads. The, the whole grain or multi-grain breads are going to be higher in protein. Um, so specifically, and this picture is only one slice, but this would be two slices of bread with peanut butter, two tablespoons of peanut butter. It would be 15 grams of protein. And three large eggs would be 18 grams of protein. So very similar. What about protein quality, you might ask? Uh, because, of course, you've heard it. Uh, well, first of all, let's explain um, if you look at uh, amino acid, uh, or sorry, if you look at uh, what proteins are made of is uh, amino acids. That's what makes up proteins. And our bodies um, don't produce certain, are, are not able to um, produce certain amino acids. So those are considered the essential amino acids, and we get those from food. Um, and there's 11 non-essential amino acids. In other words, we, our body is able to produce them um, ourselves. But, um, and so kind of the, the older paradigm was that if you're going to be eating only plant-based foods, you need to complement your protein sources so that you can get all of the essential amino acids. However, that is actually not completely true. Um, because when we look at protein combining, we see that even in foods like wheat and legumes, um, where the amino acids are lower, they still have um, a lot or all of the essential amino acids. It's just that um, you need to, uh, you know, uh, eat a variety of foods so that you're able to get the amino acids and what they were all the essential amino acids. And what they were originally saying is that you need to do that at every meal you need to get a complete source of protein. But this has actually been shown not to be true. We can actually get um, our protein throughout the day. If we're getting all the amino acids throughout the day, that would be 
fine as well. But um, there's also exceptions to this rule where some foods that are plant-based don't have all the essential amino acids or they're at least very low in certain essential amino acids. Um, for instance, quinoa, it's actually one of the plant-based sources of food that's a complete source of protein. And also soy happens to be a complete source of protein as well. Oh wait, there's actually others too. Like if you ever heard of Aramanth, it's like an ancient grain. Um, I don't know if I've ever had it. I might have had it mixed with um, other grains before. But um, anyway, the point is, is that there's options. Uh, and the position of the American Dietetic Association is that an assortment of plant-based foods consumed throughout the day can provide all essential amino acids. Typically, lacto-ovo-vegetarians and vegans meet or exceed protein requirements. Some vegan women may have marginal protein intakes, and athletes can also meet their protein needs on a plant-based diet. So, uh, the only pop population you have to sometimes watch out for is maybe vegan women who are athletes, um, and maybe they're going on very strict diets uh, to try to lose weight. Um, that might be one population you have to be careful of, but otherwise, um, they're saying that it's okay. And speaking of athletes, let's look at the gladiator diet. Believe it or not, uh, recent research has shown that the looking at the bone density, mineral density of the remains of the gladiators, uh, they demonstrate that they had a high quality diet and intense training, obviously. Um, but um, they also have been nicknamed the beans and barley munchers, the um, cordieri. Um, and apparently they are vegetarian and they have the source up there, British Broadcasting or uh, BBC. And, and uh, basically what they do is they check strontium levels uh, in the bones and apparently that can indicate what type of diet they primarily consumed. Um, and let's look at an athlete, uh, present day athlete, Scott Jurek. This guy is crazy. Uh, he's an ultra uh, marathon runner. He's a uh, road uh, runner's world top 10 greatest runners of all time and men's health 100, 100 fittest men of all time. Um, and uh, let me see some other statistics here. Three-time consecutive winner of um, Spartalon. It's 152 miles um, from Athens to Sparta, Greece. Um, Two-time consecutive winner of the 135-mile Badwater Ultramarathon. Now that is in the middle of the desert and you run 135 miles and uh, he's also done the Appalachian Trail. He's run the whole Appalachian Trail, which is over, I think it's like 2,000 something miles. And, and he did it in about, I think, 45 days or so. Um, so he's no wimp. And he just happens to be 100% plant based. Another guy, Brendan Brazier, he's a professional Ironman triathlete. Uh, and an Ironman is a uh, 2.4 mile swim, a, um, a, um, 112 mile bike and a uh, marathon all, all in one event and uh, he's also a two-time Canadian 50 kilometer ultra marathon champion and um, you know among other things and he's 100% plant-based as well so okay so it's only those lean endurance athletes right that are plant-based and can do it well actually think again uh, De uh, Mac Danzig is actually, uh, he was an MMA fighter. He's since retired, but he won 21 of 34 fights and he is 100% plant based. And there's other uh, MMA fighters as well. How about this guy? Um, Patrick Babomian. He has, uh, according to what I found, he has record breaking carry of 550 kilograms over 10 meters. He has the world record for log lifts. Um, he's a German heavyweight log lift record. Uh, strongest, he's been called the strongest man in Germany. And uh, this is, I, I recently watched a documentary called Game Changers. And uh, he is one of the athletes they feature in that 
movie, but uh, documentary. But uh, in the documentary, he says, uh, he himself says, someone asked me, how could you get as strong as an ox without eating any meat? And my answer was, have you ever seen an ox eating meat? Uh, and that's a good point. You know, the, the ox and the bull and all of these big animals, where do they get their protein? Well, they eat plants. Um, and so that's a good point. Um, we actually eat the plants through the animals that have already been digested um, and eating their flesh now. Um, uh, and uh, he said also in that documentary, he said he stopped eating meat in 2005 and he was 105 kilograms. But now, he at that time, he was 130 kilograms after becoming plant-based. And he set four world records after going plant-based. Um, uh, then uh, Dotsy Bausch, uh, she's an eight-time U.S. national cycling champion. And she said that when she transitioned to plant-based, she was originally uh, doing 300 pounds on the inverted leg sled. And there's a picture down here of the inverted leg sled. That's what it looks like. You lay down in it and push, press the weight up. And now she's doing 585 pounds uh, for 60 reps times five sets since becoming plant-based. So here's, there's many more um, Olympic athletes, UFC fighters, boxers, um, all kinds of different athletes that are getting on the plant-based bandwagon. Uh, just interesting to note. So it can, my point is that it can be done. You can get enough protein uh, and actually your performance might actually even improve if you do it the right way. So uh, what is the stance of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine? I've kind of mentioned them a few times. What is their stance on diet? They say that, um, and now the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is a um, basically part of the American College of Preventive Medicine, uh, and they have a board certification for physicians um, to get trained in um, principles of lifestyle medicine. And in regards to diet, uh, because lifestyle medicine includes multiple components, but in regards to diet, their statement is for the treatment, reversal, and prevention of lifestyle-related chronic disease, the ACLM recommends an eating plan based predominantly on a variety of minimally processed vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And this, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, um, they're, they are, the American Medical Association themselves made statements about um, how we should urge physicians to offer evidence-based lifestyle medicine interventions as the first and primary mode of preventing and when appropriate treating chronic diseases with clinical medicine. So um, yeah, diet is one part of that, but also the um, exercise is another component. And next time we're going to talk more about stress management. So we talked today about the health benefits of physical activity, the risks of physical inactivity, how to become more active, how to stay on the right track, things you probably didn't know about exercise, um, and uh, here's some encouragement for you while you're, you know, stuck at home and trying to change your exercise routine. God will give you strength. He says, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. So um, there's my references. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Sorry that uh, this went over time this time and that things didn't work out in the beginning. But thanks for those of you that stuck it out. I really appreciate it. So I think there were a couple questions in the chat. Let me check here. I don't know if some of these people are still on. Um, yes, I saw that um, there was a question about anaerobic exercise. And um, is anaerobic exercise important? So, yeah, there is something called high intensity interval training, which would primarily. Um, uh, be a higher intensity level and so your body's going to 
be using different sources uh, in your body for energy. Uh, and so basically, uh, uh, there are benefits. I think the American Heart Association um, has uh, made statements about high intensity interval training, for instance, and the health benefits. It may be something that's helpful for you if you are um, maybe shorter on time, because what you're doing is you're playing with the intensity of the exercise versus the duration. So you can increase, like I said before, you can adjust the frequency, the duration, or the intensity of exercise to get in the recommendations. And the recommendations are 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise. But if you do 25 minutes of um, vigorous exercise per day, um, um, or I think it's 15 to 20 minutes of vigorous exercise per day, you can also reap the same benefits. Um, so someone that's on a shorter schedule um, maybe that's something that may be helpful for you. Um, as far as weight loss, I'm not sure if there's a greater weight loss. Um, with that, I'm not sure what the evidence is on that right now. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Yes. Um, the question is about Bible studies. Uh, I would definitely, yes. So what I'm planning and what I'm putting together is Bible studies on Daniel and um, we will be discussing Revelation because actually those two books go together and they'll help you to understand the um, each other. So <clears throat> there's a principle and I'll just... Uh, give you a little taste now um, there's a principle that the bible interprets itself and so um, when you're looking specifically at things like prophecy like there are in revelation you want to understand what the bible says about the symbols and what they indicate and what they mean versus just having um me say oh yeah that's what it means because you know i just think so because then you can make it say whatever you want it to say. And so that's the basic principle there. And so um, that's based on a verse in the book of Isaiah, um, that principle. And uh, it's in Isaiah 28, verse 10. It says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. And so you want to look at different uh, um, verses so that you can better understand things. And that's kind of the principle that, that we'll use when we go through and look at the books of Daniel and Revelation. Uh, so I'm really excited for that, and I'm excited that you're um, also excited about it. So i um, looking forward to that. Any other questions you guys have? All right, guys. Well, Thanks all of you for coming. I can't thank you enough. Um, uh, I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, um, you know, please uh, 
just feel free to let me know. Um, you can um, message me on Facebook or um, uh, yeah, contact me on there. And uh, you know, if you have my number, you can feel free to text me as well. But um, I'm gonna sign off, guys. Thanks again. Stay active, and uh, you know, keep on, um, you know, dealing with this situation that we're in now, being stuck in our house.